welcome back to Together with Lady, where we are going to be reading through the Bible a little bit every now and then. This was supposed to be a daily thing. Um, it has not been. <laughs> but I'm just going to try to keep showing up uh, when I can, just to try to spread the word of God and <clears throat> allow you to hear the real story. Because people talk about the Bible often, and I found that sometimes they don't always hold true to what the Bible actually says. And I do that too. I think I know a story and then I go back and I actually read it. And it's really different from what I thought. So we're just going to take the raw Bible and take a look at what it really says. It's messy, it's weird, and it's not always the funnest read. But as you can tell from the last few readings that we've done, there is a story and there is actually a lot of drama, a lot of intrigue. It's a human story. It's a divine story. There's lots of different facets to it. So we're just going to keep going. And I'll have to see if I remember where we were. But basically, the last thing that we saw um, was kind of the story of, you know, Isaac um, and his son, Jacob. So Jacob has essentially cheated his brother out of his birthrights and run away. Um, and now he is uh, going to see his uncle, um, so his mother's brother. And we're going to see what happens here. So this is chapter 29 in the book of Genesis. Genesis is quite a long book. There's a lot going on in it. It's very action-packed. So we're going to continue and see what's happening next. So chapter 29, as Jacob continued on his way to the east, he looked out in a field and saw a well where shepherds took their sheep for water. Three flocks of sheep were lying around the well, which was covered with a large rock. Shepherds would roll the rock away when all their sheep had gathered there. Then after the sheep had been watered, the shepherds would roll the rock back over the mouth of the well. Jacob asked the shepherds, where are you from? We're from Haran, they answered. Then he asked, do you know Nahor's grandson, Laban? Yeah, we do, they replied. How is he? Jacob asked. He's fine, they answered. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. Jacob told them, look, the sun is still high up in the sky, and it's too early to bring in the rest of the flocks. Water your sheep and take them back to the pasture. But they replied, we can't do that until they all get here, and the rock has been rolled away from the well. While Jacob was still talking with the men, his cousin Rachel came up with her father's sheep. When Jacob saw her and his uncle's sheep, he rolled the rock away and watered the sheep. He then kissed Rachel and started crying because he was so happy. He told her that he was the son of her aunt Rebecca, and she ran out and told her father about him. That's a nice little reunion. <laughs> just, I don't know how I feel about this, a strange man just coming up and kissing me, but I guess they're cousins, so it's fine. As soon as Laban heard the news, he ran out to meet Jacob. He hugged and kissed him and brought him to his home, where Jacob told him everything that had happened. Laban said, you are my nephew, and you are like one of my own family. So you might remember Laban from the story of Rebekah and Isaac. Um, so when, Isaac, when, Jake, when Abraham's servant went to go find a wife for Isaac, he met Rachel, and Rachel or sorry, Rebecca. He met Rebecca, and this Rebecca took the servant to his house, and they were kind of um, debating whether or not Rebecca should go back with the servant, and Laban was there. So Laban kind of saw, he was a bit opportunistic in the last story, and he saw the opportunity to um, try to manipulate the situation a little bit. So that, that was also a really good read. So now Laban is back, and we're going to see what he gets up to now. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. After Jacob had been there for a month, Laban said to him, You shouldn't have to work without pay, just because you're a relative of mine. What do you want me to give you? Laban had two daughters. Leah was older than Rachel, but her eyes didn't sparkle, while Rachel was beautiful and had a good figure. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, just because of her figure, I guess, <laughs> he answered, If you will let me marry Rachel, I'll work seven years for you. Now, this seems insane to me. I don't think I've worked anywhere more than a year at most. So I could not imagine working seven years <laughs> to, to marry somebody. That's a lot. Um, 
Laban replied, it's better for me to let you marry Rachel than for someone else to have her. So stay and work for me. And this is the time when it's okay to marry your cousins, um, apparently. So just in case you're thinking it's a little weird, it is, but this was a different time. Jacob worked seven years for Laban, just in the span of one sentence, but the time seemed like only a few days because he loved Rachel so much. So maybe it is love, you know, um, if you're waiting to wait seven years for a girl, maybe it is love. Maybe it isn't just lust. I don't know. <laughs> I still have my suspicions, but this, this is some good proof that maybe he has uh, some deeper feelings. Jacob said to Laban, the time is up and I want to marry Rachel now. So Laban gave a big feast and invited all their neighbors. But that evening, he brought Leah to Jacob, who married her and spent the night with her. Laban also gave Zilpah to Leah as her servant woman. The next morning, Jacob found out that he had married Leah, and he asked Laban, Why did you do this to me? Didn't I work to get Rachel? Why did you trick me? I don't know. There, there's many theories about why um, Jacob was tricked so easily. You know, it was dark in the cave, in the tent where you know they would have been sleeping together and consummating their marriage um and leah was wearing a veil and all these other things but honestly i have to wonder if you can't even tell who you're sleeping with is it really love i don't know <laughs> um in our country the older daughter must get married first after you spend this week with leah you may also marry rachel but you'll have to work for the for me another seven years <laughs> So at the end of the week of celebration, Laban let Jacob marry Rachel. Then he gave her servant woman, Bila. Jacob loved Rachel more than he did Leah, but he had to work another seven years for Laban. So that was, that was quite the trick that Laban pulled. You know, good for him. <laughs> As we can tell, he wasn't actually worried about um, Jacob not working for him for free because he was going to make him do it anyway. Laban is definitely an interesting character. The Lord knew that Jacob loved Rachel more than he did Leah, and so he gave children to Leah, but not to Rachel. Leah gave birth to a son and named him Reuben, because she said, The Lord has taken away my sorrow. Now my husband will love me more than he does Rachel. She had a second son and named him Simeon, because she said, The Lord has heard that my husband doesn't love me. When Leah's third son was born, she said, Now my husband will hold me close. So this son was named Levi. She had one more son and named him Judah because she said, I'll praise the Lord. Now this sequence is so sad to me. Um, this unrequited love within a marriage is really hard. Maybe you've been through that as well. When you're in a marriage and the person, your spouse doesn't really love you back, uh, it must be extra complicated when you have um, you know, plural marriages like this one. But these names, you know, however long it takes for her to have a son, it's got to be at least three or four years for these four sons to be born. So each time Leah is naming her something, her son something that is like a hope in her heart, like my husband will love me, he's going to hold me, um, you know, he, <laughs> the Lord has heard that my husband doesn't love me. And then at the end, the last one is just, I'll praise the Lord. So I have to wonder, throughout this journey of having these kids, being in a relationship with a husband who doesn't love you, and, uh, you know, continuing to just cry out to the Lord. She's crying out in the names that she's giving her children. And the last one is, I'll praise the Lord. Is this her accepting that her worth doesn't come from her husband? Um, it doesn't really come from her children. It just comes from the fact that God loves her, and praising the Lord is the now the cry of her heart is she's going to give thanks so this this one really hits hard because it is very difficult to be lonely in your marriage and it's it's a journey and it can take a very long time to find your own self-worth so now chapter 30 problems between leah and rachel rachel was very jealous of leah for having children and she said to jacob i'll die if you don't give me some children but Jacob became upset with Rachel and answered, Don't blame me. I'm not God. Here, take my servant Billa, Rachel told him. Have children by her and I'll let them be born on my knees to show that they are mine. So again, we have a barren woman and we have a servant who is being asked to sleep with the master of the house to have children on behalf of the woman. 
Um, so this is actually pretty prevalent in the Bible. Um, it, there's different ways of like adopting and having surrogate children, and you don't necessarily have to be blood to be considered part of the family. There's different um, rituals and things that signify that someone who's not in your family could join your family. And this is actually um, kind of the premise in a way of a really big subplot in a, in a show called um, The Handmaid's Tale. It's a book actually by Margaret Atwood. And it's basically the society uh, where um, these women are being forced into bearing children for barren wives in the future. Um, it's a dystopian series. So this is a passage in the Bible that they quote often to justify what they're doing, which is essentially rape. They take these, they do kidnap women um, who are able to have children in this show and, er, and book, and they force them to have children on behalf of the barren wives of like high commanders and really important people. So this is what they use to justify it in this uh, dystopian society. So again, you know, taking the Bible and using it to do some very horrific things, whether in real life or in fiction. And I definitely love The Handmaid's Tale. It's a very gripping story. Um, the book and the show are both amazing. Um, the Testaments, which is like the sequel, is also amazing. Definitely check it out. So, anyway. <laughs> Then Rachel let Jacob marry Billa, and they had a son. Rachel named him Dan, because she said, God has answered my prayers. He has judged me and given me a son. When Billa and Jacob had a second son, Rachel said, I've struggled hard with my sister and won. So she named the boy Naphtali. When Leah realized she could not have any more children, she let Jacob marry her servant Zilpah, and they had a son. I'm really lucky, Leah said, and she named the boy Gad. When they had another son, Leah exclaimed, I'm happy now, and all the women will say how happy I am. So she named them, named him Asher. And you might be thinking, if you've uh, read into the Bible a little bit, that these names sound very familiar, and we're going to find out why later. So um, the next part is called Love Flowers. During the time of the wheat harvest, Reuben found some love flowers and took them to his mother, Leah. Rachel asked Leah for some of them, but Leah said, It's bad enough that you stole my husband. Now you want my son's love flowers, too. All right, Rachel answered. Let me have the flowers and you can sleep with Jacob tonight. That evening, when Jacob came in from the fields, Leah told him, You're sleeping with me tonight. I hired you with my son's love flowers. <laughs> they spent, they slept the night together that night, and God answered Leah's prayers by giving her a fifth son. Leah shouted, God has rewarded me for letting Jacob marry my servant, and she named the boy Issachar. So yeah, lots, lots of angst here. <laughs> Obviously, Leah has some, some sour grapes about the fact that she wasn't married to Jacob for more than a week, and already he had taken on his sister as a wife. And obviously, knowing that she wasn't really Jacob's first choice has caused some tension. And this is the second time that I've noticed, you know, people bargaining for these things. Um, you know, we saw with... Jacob and Esau, where Jacob kind of, or Esau sold his birthrights for some stew. <laughs> and I guess here, um, Leah sold, or yeah, Rachel sold her husband, basically, the, the right to sleep with her husband for some flowers. So this bargaining, this family drama, it's it's everywhere. And it's kind of amusing, but at the same time, I'm sure we've done the same thing. You know, we strike deals with people um, that might not be the most savory because we want what we want. And Leah now believes that she's been rewarded um, for this and for, you know, letting her servant sleep with Jacob. And that's what the next name means. <laughs> These names, man. <laughs> what what does your name mean? Is it something like this? Um, that's crazy. <laughs> So when Leah had another son, she exclaimed, God has given me a wonderful gift and my husband will praise me for giving him six sons. So again, she's starting to be a little bit more hung up on Jacob and the fact that he doesn't really love her and doesn't pay attention to her. So she named the boy Zebulun. Later, Leah had a daughter and named her Dinah. Finally, God remembered Rachel. He answered her prayer by giving her a son. 
God has taken away my disgrace, she said. I'll name the boy Joseph, and I'll pray that the Lord will give me another son. So yeah, so much drama. It's very hard when your heart is in two places. Um, I think this story is also used to illustrate the fact later on that it's really hard to serve two people. It's hard to love two wives. Um, some people try to love God and money or God and power or, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to be married to both at the same time. You kind of can't. It's You have to have one thing in your heart. Um, that's the master of your heart. So Jacob and Laban. After Joseph was born, Jacob said to Laban, Release me from our agreement and let me return to my own country. You know how hard I've worked for you. So let me take my wives and children and leave. But Laban told me, If you really are my friend, stay on and I'll pay you whatever you ask. I'm sure the Lord has blessed me because of you. So again, this opportunistic man. <laughs> Jacob answered, You've seen how hard I've worked for you, and you know how your flocks and herds have grown under my care. You didn't have much before I came, but the Lord has blessed everything I have ever done for you. Now it's time for me to start looking out for my own family. How much do you want me to pay you? Laban asked. So again, this is all about the money. <laughs> then Jacob told him, I don't want you to pay me anything. Just do one thing and I'll take care of your sheep and goats. Let me go through your flocks and herds and take the sheep and goats that are either spotted or speckled and the black lambs. That's all you need to give me. In the future, you can easily find out if I've been honest. Just look and see if my animals are either spotted or speckled, or if the lambs are black. If they aren't, they've been stolen from you. Never mind about recessive genes. <laughs> I agree to that, was Laban's response. Before the end of the day, Laban had separated his spotted and speckled animals and the black lambs from the others and put his sons in charge of them. Then Laban made Jacob keep the rest of the sheep and goats at a distance of three days' journey. Jacob cut branches from some poplar trees and from some almond and evergreen trees. He peeled off part of the bark and made the branches look spotted and speckled. Then he put the branches where the sheep and goats would see them while they were drinking from the water trough. The goats made it there in front of the branches and their young were spotted and speckled. <laughs> some of the sheep that Jacob were keeping for Laban were already spotted, and when the others were ready to mate, he made sure that they faced in the direction of the spotted and speckled ones. In this way, Jacob built up a flock of sheep for himself and did not put them with the other sheep. When the stronger sheep were mating near the drinking place, Jacob made sure that the spotted branches were there, but he would not, not put out the branches when the weaker animals were mating. So Jacob got all the healthy animals and Laban got what was left. God soon became er, Jacob soon became rich and successful. He owned many sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys, as well as a lot of slaves. So that's a... Uh, I have to wonder about this one. This is obviously, God had a part in this. This is not how genetics works. <laughs> it's not how natural selection works. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of an example of God blessing Jacob um, with this, this weird genetics thing that he's doing. But it worked. So that's great. And, you know, he was able to continue with his blessings. <laughs> Chapter 31. Jacob runs from Laban. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were complaining. Jacob is now a rich man, and he's got everything he owns, and he got everything he owns from our father. Jacob also noticed that Laban was not as friendly as he had been before. One day the Lord said, Jacob, go back to your relatives in the land of your ancestors, and I will bless you. Jacob sent for Rachel and Leah to meet him in the field where he kept his sheep, and he told them, Your father isn't as friendly with me as he used to be, but the God my ancestors worshipped has been on my side. You know that I have worked hard for your father, and that he keeps cheating me by changing my wages time after time. But God has protected me. When your father said the speckled sheep would be my wages, all of them were speckled. And when he said the spotted ones would be mine, all of them were spotted. That's how God has taken sheep and goats from your father and given them to me. Once, when the flocks were mating, I dreamed that all the rams were either spotted or speckled. Then God's angel called me by name. I answered, and he said, Notice that all the rams are either spotted or speckled. I know everything Laban is doing to you, and I am the God you worshipped at Bethel, when you purred olive oil on a rock and made a promise to me. Leave here right away and return to the land where you were born. Rachel and Leah said to Jacob, There's nothing left for us to inherit from our father. He treats us like foreigners and has even cheated us out of the bride price that should have been ours. Now, do whatever God tells you to do. Even the property God took from our father and gave to you really belongs to us and our children. 
Then Jacob and his wives and his children got on camels and left for the home of his father Isaac in Canaan. Jacob took all the flocks, herds, and other property that he had gotten in northern Syria. Before Rachel left, she stole the household idols while Laban was out shearing his sheep. Jacob tricked Laban, the Iranian, by not saying that he intended to leave. When Jacob crossed the Euphrates River and headed for the hill country of Gilead, he took with him everything he owned. So again, more family drama. Laban hasn't been treating his um, family and family-in-law very well, and he's cheated his son-in-law, he's cheated his daughters, he's cheated his um, descendants, like his grandsons, out of the land and everything that should have been their inheritance. And now Jacob is paying him back, and he's just left without saying anything, which is quite a faux pas. Laban catches up with Jacob. Three days later, Laban found out that Jacob had gone. So again, you know, Jacob was living three days' journey away from Laban and his flocks. So he took some of his relatives along and chased after Jacob for seven days before catching up with them in the hill country of Gilead. But God appeared to Laban in a dream that night and warned, don't say a word to Jacob. Don't make a threat or a promise. Jacob had set up camp in the hill country of Gilead when Laban and his relatives came and set up camp in another part of the hill country. Laban went to Jacob and said, Look what you've done! You're, you've tricked me and run off with my daughters like a kidnapper. Why did you sneak away without telling me? I would have given you a going away party with singing and with music on tambourines and harps. You didn't even give me a chance to kiss my own grandchildren and daughters goodbye. That was really foolish. I could easily hurt you. But the God your father worshipped has warned me not to make any threats or promises. I can understand why you were eager to return to your father, but why did you have to steal my idols? Jacob answered, I left secretly because I was afraid you would take your daughters from me by force. If you find that any of us have taken your idols, I'll have that person killed. Dun, 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 dun. This is where the drama gets going. <laughs> the suspense. Let your relatives be witnesses. Show me what belongs to you and you can take it back. Jacob did not realize that Rachel had stolen the household idols. Cut to black. Laban searched the tents of Jacob, Leah, and the two servant women, but did not find the idols. Then he started for Rachel's tent. She had already hidden them in the cushion she used as a saddle and was sitting on it. Laban searched everywhere and did not find them. Rachel said, Father, please don't be angry with me for not getting up. I am having my period. Laban kept on searching, but still did not find the idols. Yeah, womenly troubles. That is the best way to get men to leave you alone. <laughs> Jacob became very angry and said to Laban, What have I done wrong? Have I committed some crime? Is that why you hunted me down? After searching through everything I have, did you find anything of yours? If, you, if so, put it here where your relatives and mine can see it. Then we can decide what to do. In all the 20 years that I've worked for you, not one of your sheep or goats has had a miscarriage, and I've never eaten even one of your rams. If a wild animal killed one of your sheep or goats, I paid for it myself. In fact, you demanded the full price, whether the animal was killed during the day or at night. I sweated every day, and I couldn't sleep at night because of the cold. I had to work 14 of these 20 long years to earn your two daughters, and another six years to buy your sheep and goats. During that time, you kept changing my wages. If the fearsome God worshipped by Abraham and my father Isaac had not been on my side, you would have sent me away without a thing. But God saw my hard work, and he knew the trouble I was in, so he helped me. Then last night, he told you how wrong you were. He's finally having it out with his father-in-law. Jacob and Laban make an agreement. Laban said to Jacob, Leah and Rachel are my daughters, and their children belong to me. All these sheep you are, talking are, uh, you are taking are really mine, too. In fact, everything you have belongs to me. But there's nothing I can do to keep my daughters and their children. So I am ready to make an agreement with you, and we will pile up large rocks here to remind us of the agreement. After Jacob had set up a large rock, he told his men to get some more rocks and pile them up next to it. Then Jacob and Laban ate a meal together beside the rocks. Laban named the pile of rocks Jigger Sahad Dutha, but Jacob named it Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, this pile of rocks will remind us of our agreement. That's why the place was named Gilead. Laban also said, this pile of rocks means that the Lord will watch us both while we are apart from each other. 
So the place was also named Mizpah. Then Laban said, If you mistreat my daughters or marry other women, I may not know about it. But remember, God is watching us. Both this pile of rocks and this large rock have been set up between us as a reminder. I must never go beyond them to attack you, and you must never go beyond them to attack me. My father Nahor, your grandfather Abraham, and their ancestors all worship the same God, and we will make sure that we each keep the agreement. Then Jacob made a promise in the name of the fearsome God his father Isaac had worshipped. Jacob killed an animal and offered it as a sacrifice there on the mountain, and he invited his men to eat with him. After the meal, they spent the night on the mountain. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his daughters and his grandchildren goodbye and left to go back home. And that brings us to the end of chapter 31. So this one, again, lots of action in this story. We had some in-law troubles, you know, we all know about that. We had <laughs> this was kind of a death threat and some stealing. We don't really, I don't think that we ever find out what happens to Rachel and the fact that she took these idols um, that she's been commanded not to worship by the God of her husband. And Jacob and Laban, they just have this final agreement, uh, this final disagreement, this final war, war of words, and then they make peace. So Laban and his opportunism and just not treating his family properly, that has bit, that has come to an end. He's able to say goodbye, and they ended on a good note. So honestly, if this was a TV show, this would have been an amazing episode. <laughs> Um, just with like all the tension and all the family stuff that goes on. And again, it was real. It's real life. And I'm sure you can tell because we go through a lot of that stuff today. So next time, whenever that's going to be, we are going to come back to some characters that we left um, a few days ago. So you might remember that Jacob and Esau didn't really leave things on the best of terms. They definitely had a very dramatic end the last time we saw them and we're going to see what happens next with them so read ahead this is going to be genesis chapter 32 take a look for yourself and i will be making my comments on it the next time i see you guys so have a very blessed day and we'll see you the next time